The Apostle John's New Testament Revelation Unfolded Section 10 Chapter 6 Verse 1 And when the Lamb opened one of the seals, I saw and heard, as it were the noise of thunder, and one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. As mentioned in the commentary of Revelation 4 verse 5, the noise of thunder is the instruction and power coming from God. The angels, for beasts or cherubim, speak and do the will of the Father in all things. Therefore, their voices are also described as the noise of thunder. For the first four thousand years, while abiding by the laws of nature which govern the earth, the angels of God allow the human race to do whatever it is inclined to do according to the desires of the people. It is important to note again that the seals represent general time frames of human progression and do not specifically occur in 1,000 year intervals. However, the advanced beings who control the course of this solar system know, by their experience, that it usually takes about 1,000 years of mortal life for the transitions from one stage to another to take place. When discussing the events that occurred during the opening of the sixth seal, for example, it is better to relate the time frame as near the end of time in which we have no contact with extraterrestrial beings. If we knew of them, we would gain a greater understanding of who, why, and what we are doing on this planet, thus taking away our free will to govern ourselves according to our own knowledge. During the opening of the first four seals, the angels, the beasts, direct John to come and see what the people of the world do to themselves. What John sees is a horse and a rider, which figuratively represent the actions and interactions of humankind in its environs upon the earth. Each horse is different in color, and each rider appears unique in his actions, figuratively representing what human nature has led people to do according to their free will. Horses are wild until tamed and forced into submission by the commands of the rider. The free will of the horse, the natural world, is directed and controlled by the free will of the rider, humankind. When the fifth and sixth seals are opened, John receives no invitation to come and see, and there are no horses with riders mentioned. During the time of the fifth and sixth seals, the angels, the beasts, who during the first four seals were speaking to John figuratively in heaven and not upon the earth, are now very much involved in the state of the world, and at times, control nature and its course beyond the free will of humankind. Throughout the latter times, the angels must be available to curtail the technological and scientific understanding of the elements of the natural world, such as electricity and electronics, chemical, biological, and nuclear energy that humans begin to come up with on their own. If they do not maintain some control, the people would destroy themselves and the earth. The angels, beasts, are not present in heaven in the vision John has of the opening of the fifth and sixth seals because they are needed upon the earth doing their work and directing the course of humankind for its sake and protection. Human nature is what it is and what it has always been when free will beings are allowed to exist. There has never been a time when there have not been humans in some part of the universe. The makeup of the human body consists of billions of independent molecular entities all seeking a level of balance. This balance causes different atoms to bond together to form molecules, cells, organs, bone, and tissue. The final end of all molecular and quantum creation and interaction is to arrive at the balance they seek naturally, which balance always conforms to eternal natural laws have always existed. Humans recognize and identify this balance as happiness. To arrive at this optimum state, a set plan has been outlined, an evolution followed, and a progression set in motion that has never changed, nor ever will. This is the eternal plan of salvation attributed to God, the creator of all things, whose mysterious persona is revealed with the knowledge that there have always been gods to oversee the eternal plan of life. 
Because of their eternal experience, the gods know exactly how free-willed beings act in certain situations and under certain conditions. In modern science labs, truths are established by experimentation which includes the observation of how certain substances act and react in different environmental situations. Once the conditions have been recreated and the outcome observed long enough, and the conditions produce the exact same reactions and results, science then resolves itself to calling the conclusive outcome a law of nature, laws of mathematics, etc. Science arrives at this conclusion because the outcome becomes consistent and its behavior is replicated under the same set of circumstances. Gods are simply omnipotent, omniscient, and advanced scientists who have been observing the exact same conditions and outcomes forever, thus making the conclusions of their observations the eternal laws of heaven and earth. Gods do not experiment, having no need to increase their knowledge. They use these eternal laws to produce the end result of their desires, which in every case is to reach the final outcome all laws produce, i.e., balance. This balance is always experienced and recognized by the advanced and eternal human being as happiness. Modern science has proven on a molecular level that all atoms continue in a state of imbalance and act radically until they find their balance. When placed on an earth and given free will to act according to their natures, humans, radicals, seek happiness, balance, and act according to their free will, radically, until they find it. It takes about 7,000 years of mortality to find this balance. The human experiment, per se, follows the eternal laws of nature and will eventually produce the desired result. However, before it does, it must go through the same procedural and customary steps it has always followed to arrive at the same end. The seven seals symbolize the seven necessary steps outlined in the Book of Life, thus the book being sealed with seven seals necessary to graduate through the stages of the human experiment on this earth. This in essence becomes a trial or probationary period in which those who do not understand the full effects of happiness will, after experiencing what doesn't make them happy, John's figurative horses and riders demonstrate the different stages of this wonderful scientific exploration of happiness called mortality. Verse 2 And I saw, and beheld a white horse upon the earth, and he that sat on him had a crown given unto him, and around and about the crown appeared a rainbow, and he went forth conquering, and to be conquered. It is no secret from where John borrowed his presentation of four different colored horses. However, the secret is hidden sufficiently enough so that eyes that do not see will remain blind. And I turned, and lifted up mine eyes, and looked, and, behold, there came four chariots out from between two mountains, and the mountains were mountains of brass. In the first chariot were red horses, and in the second chariot black horses, and in the third chariot white horses, and in the fourth chariot grizzled and bay horses. Then I answered and said unto the angel that talked with me, What are these, my lord? And the angel answered and said unto me, These are the four spirits of the heavens, which go forth from standing before the Lord of all the earth. The black horses which are therein go forth into the north country, and the white go forth after them, and the grizzled go forth toward the south country. And the bay went forth, and sought to go that they might walk to and fro through the earth, and he said, Get you hence, walk to and fro through the earth. So they walked to and fro through the earth. Zechariah 6 verses 1 to 7 when humans were first introduced into the natural world, they were innocent and pure in nature, white horse, having been taught the laws by which they should abide to be happy. This truth is figuratively expressed in the stories of Adam and Eve, who walked, conversed with, and were taught by God in the metaphoric Garden of Eden. According to the figurative story, 
Once expelled from his presence, they continued for some time to live righteously as they had been commanded. Throughout scripture, a crown represents certain rights and powers given to an individual. Innocent and pure humans, the rider upon the white horse, were given the right and power to act and be acted upon, conquering, and to be conquered, according to the natural laws of the earth, and God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, conquer it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Genesis 1 verse 28, in John's figurative expressions of the human race, he uses the descriptive symbol of the twelve tribes of Israel and the stones respective to each. See the commentary on Revelation 4 verse 3. The crown is made up of twelve stones, which, when light passes through, creates a rainbow effect. This same reference to the number 12 being the people of the earth is used in Revelation 10 verse 1 and in 12 colon 1. Humans, who were given the right and power to act and to be acted upon according to their own free will, received their first instructions, light, from the gods who placed them upon the earth. Verse 3 And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. Verse 4 And there went out upon the earth another horse that was red, and a crown of power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and there was given unto him a great sword, because it was allowed that they should kill one another. During the first years of human existence, there was widespread peace and harmony until the people of the earth began to divide themselves into families, communities, cities, and nations of the world. With these divisions, each group slash nation bolstered its manifest right to exist by going forth and overrunning other lands, bringing the weakest among them under the subjection of the strongest. Peace was taken from the earth when humans began to kill each other during their quest to subjugate others under their man-made laws and ordinances. And so it happened, by the course of human nature, Satan slash Lucifer, that war began to destroy them and take away their peace and happiness. During the opening of the second seal, the horse and its rider are presented as red, symbolizing the blood spilt from the people of the earth. Verse 5 And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse went forth upon the earth, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. Verse 6 And I heard a voice that came from the throne which was in the midst of the four beasts say, Let them sell a measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, for thou sayest that they hurt not the oil and the wine. With the opening of the third seal, another aspect of human nature began to be manifested as humans placed value upon the material things of the earth and their worth according to their own judgments. This is symbolized by the pair of balances in the writer's hand. Humans began to use money buying and selling those things that were necessary for life, wheat and barley, figuratively, and hoard for themselves those things which they valued the most, oil and wine. They ascribed one person's value within their societies as greater than another simply by the nature of work each performed. During this time, the great trading nations of the earth became established, and their elite classes and leaders began to accumulate riches and strength at the expense of the poor and oppressed thus becoming accomplished in the acquisition of personal and national wealth. Worldly commerce and economy is established by the wealthy and powerful who hold the balances in their hands, determining the worth of products and of human life. Slavery is forced upon the weakened and powerless masses by the strong, who rely on them to satisfy their bottomless appetite for material gain. This is what Daniel refers to as the abomination that mocketh desolate, and which John later refers to as the beast. See Revelation 17 verses 3 to 5. It is the methods and means used to acquire the riches that make one person's house full, 
while leaving the other's house desolate and empty and arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that mocketh desolate. Daniel 11 verse 31, Furthermore, this great abomination that mocketh desolate is descriptive of the economic policies of the world, which make humans completely desolate of the Spirit of God. Their hearts become so set upon the things of the world, and its honors and glories, that their spirits are left desolate and barren as to things pertaining to righteousness, doing unto others what they would have others do unto them. Because of this abomination, few are able to become rich, but by the course of acquiring riches followed by those who do, the majority of humans are left desolate of equality and happiness. This inequality is a great abomination to the happiness promised by a God who is not a respecter of persons and has created the earth to be shared equally by all. This is, and shall always be, the abomination that brings the most misery and unhappiness to the earth and human existence. The horse and rider that represent this aspect of human nature are presented as black darkness, signifying the great wickedness of humankind because of the commerce and values set up among them. Verse 7 And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. Verse 8 And I looked, and beheld a pale horse upon the earth, and his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth, to kill with sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. Civilization advanced and progressed upon the earth until it had discovered, as it supposed, the ultimate innovation in politics, business, social welfare, and national warfare. This particular writer, Human Action, was the only one given a name by John as he leads the reader of his revelation metaphorically through the stages of human development. This name, Death and Hell, is a result of the greatest civilization ever established in the pre-modern world, and which, according to the understanding of the world at that time, covered the fourth part of the known earth. The world had never known a united group of people like this great empire. Its decadence, leisure, and world dominance permeated every aspect of life. Its soldiers meted out death to any individual or any nation that stood against it. Its sporting events included barbaric acts of competition and brutal human sacrifices, delivering thousands to death at the fangs and claws of the beasts of the earth. It literally created hell on earth for any who stood in its way. Its political policies created a very wealthy class of relatively few individuals with great power. This consequently created a middle class, which buffered the impact that absolute wealth and power had on the majority of people. This majority included the poor laboring class that always suffered in poverty. Throughout history, the poor majority had been able to rise up and overthrow the few in power when the situation called sufficiently for reformation. But during the historical period this horse and rider represent, the middle class stood in their way. Teetering on the edge of wealth and believing that they could become just as the wealthy, the middle class stood between the rich and poor, coveting one, while fearing a return to the other, validating the actions of the rich, while pacifying the cries of the poor. The military strength of this type of human civilization overpowers weaker nations and leaves many desolate, causing thousands of deaths from the effects of war, hunger, disease, and poverty left over from its military conquests and occupations. There is no part of this type of civilization that promotes equality or the royal law do unto others what you would have them do unto you. Until modern times, there has not been another nation rise to such world prominence according to the principles and desires founded in its name, works, until this type of society's modern fraternal twin came up out of the earth. See Revelation 13 verse 11. People use their free will to become what they desire, 
and by these actions make a name for themselves. Given time in following their innate natures, the human race seeks self-validation through unification. The name given anciently, the Great Roman Empire, and in modern times, the United States of America represents the works of the Pale Horse and its rider. These man-made names can well be described as death, both physical and spiritual, with its effects creating a literal hell on earth. When desires are set upon materialism and the honors of pride, the world loses its spiritual roots the blood that gives life to its body. For our own sake, we are allowed, power was given unto them, to form these societies. In these societies, the sacrifice of the blood of Jesus Christ, which is his teaching us how to love one another, is nowhere to be found. Thus, John presents it as a pale horse strong in might and purpose, and able to bear its rider, but barren of the blood, of Christ, that brings color to its skin. Verse 9 and when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw the souls of them upon the earth who were slain upon the altar for the word of God, and for the testimony which they held. An altar is something built by mortal hands for the purpose of making an offering upon it, usually dedicated to a deity. When one obeys the commands of God, one is effectually dedicating his or her works upon the altar before God, figuratively exclaiming, Here, O oh my God, are my works that I have fulfilled and dedicated to thee. Therefore, being slain upon the altar means that one has sacrificed one's life for the word of God by keeping his commandments. In the same spirit Jesus said, He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that lusseth his life for my sake shall find it. Matthew 10 verse 39 John is referring to all those upon the earth who have lost their lives in dedication to obeying the commands of God. It is truly a great sacrifice to live the gospel of Jesus Christ in a world that rejects it. The gentle and reassuring spirit of Psalms explains, I will say unto God my rock, Why hast thou forgotten me? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a sword in my bones, i.e., being slain, mine enemies reproach me, while they say daily unto me, Where is thy God? Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him, who is the health of my countenance, and my God. Judge me, O God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation, O oh, deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man. For thou art the God of my strength, why dost thou cast me off? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? O oh, send out thy light and thy truth, let them lead me, let them bring me unto thy holy hill, and to thy tabernacles. Then will I go unto the altar of God, unto God my exceeding joy, yea, upon the harp will I praise thee, O God, my God, why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, who is the health of my countenance, and my God. Psalms 42 verses 9 to 11, 43 colon 1, 5. Isaiah reiterates the purpose and symbolism of altars. At that day shall a man look to his Maker, and his eyes shall have respect to the Holy One of Israel. And he shall not look to the altars, the work of his hands, neither shall respect that which his fingers have made, either the groves or the images. Isaiah 17 verses 7 to 8 Moses was commanded to construct an altar to specify dimensions. This is symbolic of the commandments of God being specific in their purpose, which Jesus gives as the greatest law and commandment of all the prophets do unto others what you would have them do unto you. Ezekiel borrows the symbolism to reiterate that the law of God is exact, and thus should our works be exact as we offer them upon an altar before the Lord. The altar of wood was three cubits high, and the length thereof two cubits, 
and the corners thereof, and the length thereof, and the walls thereof, were of wood. And he said unto me, This is the table that is before the Lord. Ezekiel 41 verse 22 Ezekiel continued in his teachings by figuratively expressing that we should purge ourselves of sin, which is anything we do to another that we wouldn't want done to us, and purify our lives throughout mortality, seven days, which is our symbolic offering upon the altar to God. Seven days shall they purge the altar and purify it, and they shall consecrate themselves. Ezekiel 43 verse 26 Verse 10 And the four and twenty elders cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge them that dwell on the earth and avenge their blood, which has been spilt upon the altar? In other words, the prophets who have been sent to teach the people what they should do to serve God properly are asking how long the Lord will allow the earth to remain in a state where living the word of God is such a tremendous sacrifice. Verse 11 And white robes were given unto every one of them who were sacrificed upon the altar, and it was said unto them, that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants and their brethren who would also be killed upon the altar as they were should fulfill their works. Uninspired teachers would interpret the above passage as referring to those called of God, or in this case, who have called themselves to be missionaries, pastors, bishops, or administrators of God's word. They assume in a pious attitude of sacrifice and self-glorification that these leaders must also be killed before the Lord comes again. Inasmuch as the true nature of slain or sacrificed upon the altar has now been properly revealed, John's later description of those given white robes puts the truth in proper perspective, after this I beheld, and, lo, this great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations, and kindreds, and people, and tongues, stood before the throne, and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, and palms in their hands, and one of the elders spake unto me, saying, Who are these who are arrayed? In white robes? And from whence did they come? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they who came out of great tribulation, and have washed their own robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Revelation 7, 9, 13-14 Clothing has always symbolized one's actions, deeds, and thoughts. Notice John was not told that Christ washed the blood out of the robes, but these have washed their own robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. The works of Christ cannot save us unless we learn to do the same works he did, apply the principles he taught, and follow the example he set, and for which he lost his life, and lose ours in the same way. Here John is telling us that those who follow the teachings and precepts of Christ will rest from all worldly trials and adversity that cause tribulation in one's life, supporting what he heard Jesus teach the people. Come unto me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Matthew 11 verses 28 to 30 All must be allowed to live in mortality, and prove themselves worthy to live in eternal worlds where they will not cause problems. Until one learns to always do unto another that which they would want done unto them, they will not be allowed to possess an exalted body that never dies and live on a planet which supports this type of body. Those who learn and apply the gospel of Jesus Christ, given a white robe, will rest from tribulations and hell that others are experiencing in life. Nevertheless, Mortality must be allowed to continue yet for a little season until all have been given ample opportunity to fulfill their works. Verse 12 And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and, lo, there was a great earthquake, and the earth reeled to and fro like a drunkard, and the sun became black, 
clothed in a sackcloth made of hair, because the moan was turned into blood. One of the most significant rules in understanding the writings of prophets is this, when a prophet is expressing himself figuratively, everything he writes is given as a figurative expression. The reader cannot pick or choose which parts of the prophecy are literal and which parts are symbolic. Common sense tells us that the sun cannot become black as sackcloth of hair and the moon cannot turn into blood. Therefore, those who are waiting for the literal great earthquake of this otherwise figurative portrayal are going to be waiting a long, long time. False teachers and leaders have misinterpreted what is going to happen in fulfillment of this verse, when in fact, the great earthquake is occurring even as they read these words. They simply do not know or understand the metaphoric way in which it is presented to them in John's writings. To understand these things, one must take into consideration the source from which John took his symbolism. Throughout the Old Testament, clues are given to help reveal the proper origin and understanding of John's mysterious metaphors. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light, the sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. And I will punish the world for their evil, and the wicked for their iniquity, and I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease, and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. Therefore I will shake the heavens, and the earth shall remove out of her place, in the wrath of the Lord of hosts, and in the day of his fierce anger. Isaiah 13 verses 10 to 13 Isaiah is saying that people are not allowing the light from within to shine forth in good works, stars that shall not give their light. Therefore, they receive none of the light from God, sun shall be darkened. The prophets are those who teach and preach to the people who live in darkness, reflecting the light they receive from God to the people who are in need of harsh reminding to return to the commandments of God. The moon has no light of its own, but reflects the light of the sun that shone yesterday and the sun that will shine tomorrow, giving this light to a darkened world. The prophets of God are metaphorically presented as the moon. When the people choose wickedness over righteousness, God withdraws his prophets from among the people. The moon shall not cause her light to shine. When the people reject, cast out, and kill the prophets, the moon becomes his blood. The earthquakes represent the great wickedness of the human race upon the earth, signifying that the world as a whole is not doing what it was naturally commanded to do stand with balance and firmness in keeping the commandments of God. Isaiah's writings give further explanation, and it shall come to pass that he who fleeth from the noise of the fear shall fall into the pit, and he that cometh up out of the midst of the pit shall be taken in the snare, for the windows from on high are open, and the foundations of the earth do shake. The earth is utterly broken down, the earth is clean dissolved, the earth is moved exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard, and shall be removed like a cottage, and the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it, and it shall fall, and not rise again. And it shall come to pass in that day, that the Lord shall punish the host of the high ones that are on high, and the kings of the earth upon the earth. And they shall be gathered together, as prisoners are gathered in the pit, and shall be shut up in the prison, and after many days shall they be visited. Then the moon shall be confounded, and the sun ashamed, when the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion, and in Jerusalem, and before his ancients gloriously. Isaiah 24 verses 18 to 23 Those in mourning wear sackcloth. John suggests that God is in mourning when people live wickedly. God figuratively blackens the sky with a sackcloth made of hair, thereby keeping the light of the sun from shining through to give warmth to the earth. In other words, because of the wickedness of the people, God does not send revelation or inspiration. 
the first part of the human body that receives warmth from the sun when a person is standing erect is the head, which is covered with hair. Here John presents the hair as black, signifying that the head is receiving no sunlight, which would have lightened the hair with more exposure. Similarly, we have the vision of Christ in which he is seen as one with hair as white as snow. Other Old Testament writings reiterate John's theme. How then can man be justified with God? Or how can he be clean that is born of a woman? Behold even to the moon, and it shineth not, yea, the stars are not pure in his sight. Job 25 verses 4 to 5 Wherefore, when I came, was there no man? When I called, was there none to answer? Is my hand shortened at all, that it cannot redeem? Or have I no power to deliver? Behold, at my rebuke I dry up the sea, I make the rivers a wilderness, their fish stink, because there is no water, and dieth for thirst. I clothe the heavens with blackness, and I make sackcloth their covering. Isaiah 50 verses 2-3 to three. And when I shall put thee out, I will cover the heaven, and make the stars thereof dark, I will cover the sun with a cloud, and the moon shall not give her light. All the bright lights of heaven will I make dark over thee, and set darkness upon thy land, saith the Lord God. Ezekiel 32 verses 7 to 8 The earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. Joel 2 verse 10 Verse 13 and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth because of the great earthquake, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. We now know that the great earthquake is figurative of the wickedness of humankind. We know also that John uses stars to represent the inhabitants of the earth. Therefore, why do the stars of heaven fall to the earth as the untimely fig? Because the unbalanced people are shaken by the earthquake, wickedness, which causes them to fall into transgression. John borrowed Isaiah's figurative expressions. And all the host of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll, and all their hosts shall fall down, as the leaf falleth off from the vine, and as a falling fig from the fig tree. Isaiah 34 verse 4 Throughout scripture, prophets have referred to people and their works as fig or olive trees. The tree itself represents humankind, its branches, the differing peoples of the earth. The fruit of the tree represents the actions, deeds, and thoughts of the people. The word of God is the sunshine and the rain that comes from heaven which nourishes the tree. The roots take in the nutrition from the earth, representing the work of the prophets upon the earth, which include the greatest prophet of all, Jesus Christ, who said, A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon, and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and find none, cut it down, why cumbereth it the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it, and dung it, and if it bear fruit, well and if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. Luke 13 verses 6 to 9 When a fig tree receives proper nutrition and pruning, it thrives, and its branches and fruit stand strong and firm against all winds. When it has not been nourished properly, its branches and fruit are weak and unable to hang on and are cast to the earth before they are fully ripened. This means that before humankind learns the proper way to live with each other, being ripened, in preparation to receive eternal bodies and live on eternal planets, they will most certainly fall because of the winds which will later be revealed as the false doctrines and precepts of the world that blow upon the earth. All true prophets knew this secret. I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness, 
I saw your fathers as the first ripe in the fig tree at her first time, but they went to Balpeor and separated themselves unto that shame, and their abominations were according as they loved. Hosea 9 verse 10 All thy strongholds shall be like fig trees with the first ripe figs. If they be shaken, they shall even fall into the mouth of the eater. Nahum 3 verse 12 The vine is dried up, and the fig tree languisheth, the pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, and the apple tree, even all the trees of the field, are withered, because joy is withered away from the sons of men. Joel 1 verse 12 But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts hath spoken it. Micah 4 verse 4 Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines, the labor of the olive shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat, the flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Habakkuk 3 verse 17 Verse 14 And it came to pass that the heavens opened as a scroll is opened when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place because of that which was written therein. Figuratively, every action, every deed, and every thought are symbolically written in a book, scroll, kept in heaven. In other words, the works of humankind are recorded through the technological advancement of beings which reach far beyond our current capabilities of making a video documentary of someone's life. The mystery is that the recording devices are incorporated into our own spiritual makeup, which elements have the ability to record everything we think and do. Not permitted to explain this mystery in its fullness in their day, the ancient prophets made reference to what John has hinted, Take thee a roll of a book, and write therein all the words that I have spoken unto thee against Israel and against Judah and against all the nations, from the day I spake unto thee, from the days of Josiah, even unto this day. It may be that the house of Judah will hear all the evil which I purpose to do unto them, that they may return every man from his evil way, that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. Jeremiah 36 verses 2-3 to three. And when I looked, behold, an hand was sent unto me, and, lo, a roll of a book was therein, and he spread it before me, and it was written within and without, and there was written therein lamentations, and mourning, and woe. Ezekiel 2 verses 9 to 10 Of all the attributes of humankind that draw us away from doing unto others what we would expect to have done unto us, none is as devastating and corruptive to peace and happiness as pride. Pride causes many to put themselves above others or to separate themselves, believing they are superior. The prophets figuratively characterized those who put themselves above others as mountains. Those who isolate themselves from the rest of the world, believing they are more righteous than others, are expressed as islands. When the truth is finally revealed, when the scroll, containing the memories of what they have done, is opened up, the exalted and isolated will learn of their great wickedness and will be brought down. This is because they will realize that they are no different, no better, or no more right than any other person upon the earth. John's continued prophecy, and every island fled away, and the mountains were not found, see Revelation 16 verse 20, reinforces what his ancient mentors proclaimed. Keep silence before me, O islands, and let the people renew their strength. Let them come near, then let them speak. Let us come near together to judgment. Isaiah 41 verse 1 According to their deeds, accordingly he will repay, fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies, to the islands he will repay recompense. Isaiah 59 verse 18 and the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face toward the mountains of Israel, and prophesy against them, and say, Ye mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord God. Thus saith the Lord God to the mountains, and to the hills, 
to the rivers, and to the valleys, behold, I, even I, will bring a sword upon you, and I will destroy your high places. Ezekiel 6 verses 1 to 3 Verse 15 And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, yea, even every man who bringeth bondage upon another who is not free, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. Verse 16 And these said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, whose countenance we cannot bear. Verse 17 For the great day of his wrath is come, and who among us shall be able to stand? John has shown us the stages and effects of human development when we are left to our own devices with complete control over our environment and actions. Our Father and Creator does not get angry as we prefer to think or have been taught by false leaders and teachers. John has led us to quite a different understanding of what is meant when we speak of the, the wrath of God, which refers to his non-intervention in the affairs of humankind. When we are undeserving, we are left to suffer the full effects of our self-imposed situations. He has taught us that when we do not live by the royal law, we do not receive the intervention or divine instruction from above through righteous and true prophets the sun is darkened, no light or revelation is given because of our wickedness. As a result of rejecting the prophets and killing them, the moon is turned into blood. This is the wrath of God. It is happening now and will continue until Christ himself comes to the earth to teach what he has always taught, do unto others what you would have them do unto you. Our pride, our families, our nations, our desire for material gain and honor, and all of our works due to our human natures, lead us away from this royal law upon which all other laws and all the prophets are predicated. Therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Matthew 7 verse 12, John is warning us, as did those before him, but they that escape of them shall escape, and shall be on the mountains like doves of the valleys, all of them mourning, every one for his iniquity. All hands shall be feeble, and all knees shall be weak as water. They shall also gird themselves with sackcloth, and horror shall cover them, and shame shall be upon all faces, and baldness upon all their heads. They shall cast their silver in the streets, and their gold shall be removed. Their silver and their gold shall not be able to deliver them in the day of the wrath of the Lord. They shall not satisfy their souls, neither fill their bowels, because it is the stumbling block of their iniquity. Ezekiel 7 verses 16 to 19, But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand before him with clean hands when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, which is used to remove the impurities of element, and like fuller's soap, which is used to clean the works of his hands. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver and of gold. And with a fervent heat shall the elements of this earth be refined, even the gold and silver filled with dross. And he shall purify the sons of Levi, who have corrupted the people and led them astray, filling them with dross. And he shall purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. For behold, all their offerings they have polluted, and there are none who are pure. But they shall know good at that day, that they might cast out the evil from among them. Malachi 3 verses 2-3 this concludes chapter 6.